la fortuna, certamente, <laughs> senza altro. Let me thank, first of all, let me thank Jens Niebaum for the invitation to make this. Can you all hear? Yeah. Elizabeth Keevan for the invitation to come to Rome and to undertake the project that uh, we are now undertaking. I'm very, very grateful. Um, with very little time left in this conference, we need to be brief. And so uh, we have structured this presentation basically in three parts. First, we'll offer a sort of orientation to the site, which I hesitate to do in front of this audience, but it nevertheless is uh, a requirement. Then we introduce Bramante, or what remains of his work in Bernini's Scalareggia. And finally, we propose some ways to consider how Bramante might have inspired Bernini here at the only place where, apart from the Basilica, the work of these two architects ever come together. This is the beginning of a new look at Bernini's work on this particular site. It follows my book of 1997. Um, my collaborator, Maria Grazia D'Amelio, has agreed with me that, uh, nevertheless, brevity at this point is itself a contribution. I will try to be brief. This is the story of Bramante's Via Giulia Nova and Bernini's Scala Regia, both monumental staircases that provided access to the main reception rooms of the Vatican Palace. Both structures also brought new grandeur to the connection between the palace and the Basilica of St. Peter. Bramante built the Via Giulia Nuova for Julius II in the years 1506-1508 in connection with the foundation of new St. Peter's and other grand plans for the palace. His staircase continued to be known throughout the Cinquecento by the name of Julius. Bernini Scalareggia instead was built in connection with his work on Piazza San Pietro, uh, which was first ordered by uh, Pope Alexander VII in 1656. The North Colonnade arm was at this point here in 1661, uh, when it was prolonged by the Northern Corridor, which was finished at the end of 1662. And from 1663 to 66, Bernini built the Scala Regia, which, like its predecessor, rose up to the west to a double landing and then turned 180 degrees to rise further along the wall, the south wall of the Cappella Sistina to enter into the palace at the Sala Regia. I apologize for the next slide. It comes from my Vatican Course 101. But you do need to know these things. Where the Sistina is located, where the Sala Regia is located at right angles to the Sistina. The Sala Ducale is here in front of and to the south of the Sala Ducale is the Cortile del Marasciallo, the marshal of the conclaves, and then further to the east is the Cortile di San Damaso here, and you see it in this view here. To enter Bernini's Scalareggia today, normally you would enter through the Portoni di Bronzo, right here, go along the corridor to the foot of the staircase of the Scalareggia, which is, as you'll see in a minute, very brightly lit. It's brightly lit despite the fact that it's englobed in the palace complex 
because light comes into that space through this large window right here, the finestrone, I've labeled it. Uh, all the labels are in my poor Italian, but I hope it enables you to follow along with uh, what, I'm, what I'm about to say. Ah, okay. There you see the illumination at the end of the corridor produced by that finestrone. This passage, the corridor, actually widens as it moves westward. By contrast, the Scala Regia has walls that narrow, rows of columns that converge, and a barrel vault whose radius is continuously and consistently diminishing as the staircase rises. Although the lengths of both of those axes appear to be comparable, the stairs are only one-third as long as the corridor is. The result is calculated and purposeful. After walking the corridor, one sees an ascent of great length. Yet climbing the staircase is in fact easily accomplished relative to one's visible or visual expectations. Thus you are rocketed up to the summit before you expect that. Any official greeter at the top will appear larger with respect to the architectural setting than you will at the bottom next to yours. Although um, rarely noted, I just mentioned the fact that the northern corridor is in fact a, a large buttress, it's a contraforte, against the higher ground of the Monsacorum, which is about 20 meters taller than the grade level, the quota of the, of the piazza. Um, that ground was used for the early Vatican Palace, extending from the Basilica for obvious defensive reasons. In uh, his 1974 book on Alberti and Nicholas V, Bill West, William Westfall has illustrated uh, features of the medieval palace before the 17th century interventions. Um, and the point that I want to make here is that the palace had an entrance gate here. You went into the so-called atrium helvetiorum, the curia prima, if you want. Came up a set of staircases, a set of stairs here into or onto what became the court, known as the Cortile del Maresciallo. The Cappella Magna was here, and the what we call now the Sala Regia, but was then the Aula Mayor or the Aula Prima was here, and these are the rooms that were joined to become what is now the Sala Ducale. Westfall, when he made that image of the Palazzo Inferiore and the Palazzo Superiore, higher and lower palaces, um, cannot have known what Kirsch and Steinmann intuited as early as 1898 and 1901, uh, respectively, namely that the Capella Magna is the Sistina, and the Aula Prima is the uh, Salareggia. Not a replacement, but they are actually those buildings. Our knowledge about these facts um, is a relatively new discovery, first announced by Fabrizio Mancinelli in 1988, published two years later by John Sherman, and uh, two years after that, 1992, by Professor Pagliara. Pagliara was uh, instrumental in that discovery. 
Um, I'll just mention very briefly that this shows also the small chapel, the Capella Parva, here that was sacrificed when a staircase from the Marashallo to the um, Salareja was widened. And at that time, which was under Paul III Farnese, the uh, Capella Paulina was built. This is something I'm sure you're aware of. So after the expansion of the medieval Capella Magna by Sixtus IV in the late Quattrocento, Julius II enlarged the Aula Magna. Then we know in the 1530s, the Capella Parva was demolished to widen the staircase that I just mentioned, and a new Capella Paulina was built on the axis of the, of the Sala Regia. It's helpful, I think, for what follows, to understand that the level of the Marashallo today is the same as the level underneath the Sistine Chapel. Um, that level was known, uh, for various reasons, we don't need to discuss them now, as the Paradiso. Um, next to the so-called Paradiso space is, was, is, was a large rectangular room that likely served as stables and is referred to in 1209 as the Mariscalchia. The Mariscalchia and the Paradiso correspond in level to the double landing of Bernini's Scalareggia. Originally, the Mariscalchia extended further south than it does today. Today it has one, two, three, four bays, one, two, three, four bays. It was cut off here where you see my red line so that the staircase could burrow up through it. Those vaults had to be destroyed so that the staircase could continue to come up and maintain uh, a monumental height. So I said that what remains of the Mariscalchia is still visible in what used to be, anyway, Gallery 32 of the Papal Collection of Modern Art in the Musei Vaticani. Now, finally, to Bramante and Uffizi 287, the Disegno Grandissimo, as identified by Professor Gustav Trommel on the basis of its description in the 1550 edition of Vasari. Trommel now dates the drawing, at least as of 2010, uh, to 1506, and now attributes it to the hand of Bramante himself, rather than, as previously, to Antonio del Pellegrino. This doesn't enter into our discussions. The date does, not the attribution of the, of the actual hand. The, the important point is that the scheme dates to the time of the foundation of New St. Peter's. Its main feature is obviously this new conclave hall and uh, presumably a stables that go with it, as well as an, an enclosed courtyard uh, providing a monumental entrance to the lower court of the Belvedere, uh, the Cortile del Belvedere. The essential question posed by this drawing remains, I think, after more than three decades of study. Is this a project which is merely dedicated to future dreams or developments? Or is it a project that already incorporates some workable new Julian contributions to the palace fabric? Or perhaps both? I suppose or neither, but that's a possibility which we'll throw out as being much less interesting. In, in some ways, the drawing is obviously and evidently very schematic. Other ways, the drawing is quite precise. 
the rendering of the monumental staircase between the aula prima and the level of the, uh, the uh, atrium Helvetiorum and the basilica, that staircase is quite specifically uh, delineated. And that is the path, precisely the path, that Bernini's Scalareggia would, would follow, Scalareggia burrowing through that audience, through the uh, Mariscalchia, as I just described, and I'll show you that in greater detail. Uh, I want you to just remember that this all takes place on the southern wall, against the southern wall or the southern hip of, of the Sistina. Um, it's my opinion now that we're looking at a part of the plan which will be executed as drawn on this sheet. And here's why. Um, the Via Julia Nova can be documented from demolitions recorded in May 1506 and from payments for construction registered in 1508. This is published material. It is mentioned by name when the Pope first used it uh, in Easter in 1507, which occurred on uh, April 4th, and then at Pentecost, which was on May 31st of the same year. Then again, during the visit of Charles V in 1536, Paul III led his guest from the Basilica to the Upper Palace, Per Scalas Novas Julii Ad Salam Regiam. Because details like the risers that radiate around the double landing are confirmed in drawings later drawings such as this by San Gallo, Uzi 572, because the dimensions of the treads here, 16 and a half palmi, correspond with Bernini's dimensions at that point, it's reasonable to assume that they assumed exactly those dimensions on the Disegno Grandissimo. And uh, furthermore, I would like to believe that these dimensions, these measurements, correspond with what I think are surviving traces of Bramante's staircase. Um, and the dimensions that they involve. It becomes harder to believe that uh, this is inaccurate than it is accurate in some uh, parenthetically, I just say right now that on the Disegno Grandissimo here in, uh, under this circle, there's a small passage which is um, on the southeast wall of the Sistina, which, which Professor Pagliara excavated during restorations of the chapel in 1998. It was here that he found evidence behind the Quattrocento frescoes of a doorway in medieval masonry with door jams that were done in medieval brick uh, that make us aware that Sixtus IV's building was in fact a medieval building brought up to date. Um, he doesn't remember sharing that with me and uh, that's for, I suppose, two reasons. One is that it was 25 years ago and the other is, I'm sure he was sharing that information as, as is characteristic of him with probably everybody at the time, largely unpublished information. Um, so um, the question would be, is that opening leading to a staircase that goes down to the Basilica and the Atrium Helpetiorum, or is it a staircase that goes just down to this area called the Paradiso underneath the Sistina? Or could it just go to spaces, rooms, immediately south of that opening? And for that 
question, we really have no answer. The evidence that, there has, that has been brought forth, I consider to be tentative. It's interesting, but it, doesn't, it can't be relied upon. What remains indisputable is the fact that, as far as I know, Bramante was the first to monumentalize an access to the upper palace from the west, linking the lower palace with, and uh, St. Peter's to the upper palace. And the second point is that this site was reused for the present Scalareggia built by Bernini. With that in mind, it's tantalizing to wonder if Bramante's Via Iulia Nova was every bit as tall and as imposing as Bernini's. Evidence, I believe, suggests that it was. That is to say, I would like to believe that Bramante's staircase also required the demolition of those last one, two, three bays of the former Mariscalchia in 1506. A diagram adapted from a drawing that comes from the uh, Vatican Servizi Tecnici. This is a, basically a, a drawing that, that we adapted. Um, reveals that there's a crawl space below the floor of the Salaregia and above the vaults of Bernini's Scalaregia. The drawing reveals that the columns, and you see them here continuing up as knee walls, were bearing columns. They were supporting columns. Um, we can also see some rough signs here of curves that are very hard to, uh, to record because the space is extremely small. Um, I was there uh, earlier this week and I declined to go in them again. I guess I've grown. I guess I'm too big to go in there again because I once did it. And what I found when I did go in is, for example, that if you're here where my pointer is, looking in this direction, you'll see above you a kind of vault falling in this way. So from this outside wall, which is here, the vault falls in and down, in and down, like this one does. Um, there are crawl spaces here. Uh, what you see are huge timbers that Bernini must have set up to help support those old vaults of the Mariscalchia. And then this shows the same sort of construction on the other side. Uh, the, the vault is, the old vault, is falling in this direction. Um, the curve is not accurate because I'm not good with computers, but um, the curve falls towards the outside, towards the outside of the outside wall of the staircase. Again, it has to be held in place because if you break what supports those vaults, the vaults are in essence hanging and they'll just fall if they're not supported. 